All right, hello everybody. It is me, Daniel D, with the Crazy Comedy Humor and Satire Podcast. This is episode number 37 for Sunday, March 1st, 2020. Uh, how the hell are you guys doing out there? Um, it is the season of Lent. We had last week, we had Mardi Gras, aka Fat Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday, the day before this season of penance and mortification of the flesh when you just feel guilty about everything and try to be, you know, feel guilty and give up stuff so that, you know, God doesn't strike you dead. So on to prepare for that, on Tuesday, you go out and get as drunk as you can, have as much sex as you can, have as much uh, king cake and other goodies as you possibly can, throw some beads at some hot-looking young women, get them to show you their titties and uh, other things. That way you prepare yourself, you know, spiritually, uh, for Ash Wednesday and Lent. Um, yeah, you know, I think that Mardi Gras needs a name change. Why? Because in French, or Mardi Gras is French for Fat Tuesday. And I think we do too much fat shaming in our culture. And to have a holiday where you celebrate gluttony and excess, and you name it Fat Tuesday, well, that's just going to make people ashamed of being fat. That. And so we need to change the name of Mardi Gras to like plus size Tuesday. I don't know what that would be in French, but uh, you know, something like that, you know. No, I'm just kidding, of course. Call it Mardi Gras, you know. Uh be fat. I don't know why people are ashamed to be fat, you know. Hey, it's like something to be proud of, you know. Our hunter-gatherer ancestors only dreamed of having this much fat, you know, around their guts. To, to guard against starvation and famine and stuff like that. You know, hey, me, I got a little spare tire around the middle. But if I was to go to a hunter-gatherer society or a starving country or like Ethiopia during the height of its famine or whatever in the 80s, guess what? I would have been seen as like a stud muffin. Women would have wanted to mate with me. They would assume that I got the, you know, the ability to provide because I'm able to provide so much food for myself. So, uh, you know, I don't think being fat is anything to be ashamed of. I think we need to have some fat pride, you know. Uh, Anyway, all right. So uh, it is the season of Lent. Uh, Ash Wednesday was this past week. Now it's Lent. And you're supposed to, if you're Catholic, Orthodox, Episcopalian, or so forth, uh, you know, it's one of the things to draw close to God. You're supposed to make a sacrifice, you know, by giving something up for the 40 days of Lent. So this year for Lent, I decided to give up Christianity. <laughs> Boom. Yep. Gave up Christianity. So that'll be my sacrifice during the season of Lent. No church for me. You know, I would go to church. I would wake up early. But I want to sacrifice to show God I mean business. So I'm going to force myself to sleep in. Force myself not to put any money on the offering plate. Instead, I'm going to spend it on hookers and beer and stuff like that. You know, because I think that's just, uh, you know, going to show God I mean business. All right. It is coronavirus time. Um the coronavirus, people are freaking out about it, you know, and I don't think coronavirus is really all that bad, I mean, yeah, you know, some people might die, you know, some old people, you know, I mean, they're gonna die anyway, so, you know, it just kind of, like, saves them the money of, uh, you know, having to plan their, you know, a long-term care, you know, in a nursing home, it'll just, uh, you know, so I think it could be helpful in that regard, the other thing is, if you're in line, let's just say, and you want to get to the front of the line, but you don't want to be rude and cut in front of people, right? What can you do now that coronavirus is a thing? <coughs> Start coughing and just say, oh man, I'm, excuse me. <coughs> you guys might want to stand back. I, my my uh, uncle had coronavirus. <coughs> uh, I think I might be coming down with something. <coughs> Please pray for me. I hope I'm not getting, you know, and that will clear the fucking line. You will move to the front of the line because everybody will disappear, you know? So, I mean, there's some good things about coronavirus, you know? Um, not so good, I guess, if you're uh, the Corona Beer Company. I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe there's there's no such thing as bad publicity, they say, you know? So, we'll see if that's true. Maybe the, the negative publicity around the name Corona will actually remind people of Corona Beer and they'll go out and drink it. I don't know. We'll see. But, um... You know, I think it, I'm actually 
Okay, so part of me is like, yeah, I should feel bad, you know, that people are getting sick and that, you know, if this thing really spreads, people will die. You know, that's always unfortunate. But part of me is like, bring this fucking shit on. The idea of being under quarantine actually sounds pretty nice, you know? I mean, be uh, able to catch up on my reading and, you know, be able to sleep in. I mean, what's so bad about being under quarantine? One thing that I do wonder is... um. All right, there will be a lot of couples that will be forced to stay around each other all day, every day, seven days a week, you know, under quarantine, right? A lot of uh, cohabiting couples, married couples, right? Um, They'll, you know, run low on supplies, including medication. So they'll run low on birth control. They'll also run low on their psychiatric medication. So you got husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, all of a sudden around each other, 24-24, can't get away from each other, no birth control, and no psychiatric medication. So one of two things is going to happen. Either the birth rate is going to skyrocket in about nine months, or the murder rate is going to skyrocket, like, soon, you know? So which is it going to be? Now, this is going to be an interesting thing to see. Will people fuck and uh, make babies, or will they kill each other? We'll see. Uh, Anyway... Just want to say before I get further, uh, this episode of the Crazy Comedy Humor and Satire Podcast is brought to you by a shameless plug for my book, Super Hashtag SJW Man, a call-out culture superhero, which is available as an ebook and a paperback on Amazon. Audiobook is coming soon. You've never met a superhero like Super Hashtag SJW Man. The superheroes of the past fought crime as a call-out culture superhero. Super Hashtag SJW Fights. Super hashtag SJW man fights insensitive tweets and microaggressions. Yep, it's not a bird, it's not a plane, it is a super woke wacko, and he is dressed up like a superhero, ready to save the day from, uh, you know, insensitive people and sensitive tweets and, and all that sort of stuff. So if you're interested in uh, a satire of the super woke, it's kind of a funny book, uh, check it out. Um, super hashtag SJW man. I'll have a link to the book, by the way, in the show notes. Um, but anyway, back to the episode at hand. Um, you know, advertising is something that is kind of interesting. I mean, it obviously it works, which is kind of depressing. But, um, you know, it's kind of funny in a way, too. Like, you know, was going down the street and you see these etern- attorney billboards all over the place. And they'll have, like, uh, you know, some of them will just have a number with, like, Twelve million dollars, or something like that, you know. And it's like, uh, in very small print, I guess it says what the twelve million is for. Actually, there's like a a uh, caveat in fine print. It'll say like, this is not meant to denote a uh, specific a guarantee of you know legal results and you know things like that. But you know, I just thought it'd be kind of funny to throw up advertisements like that. Fifteen million dollars, and then in, you know. The, the quote say, this is the amount that Mick Jagger made from, you know, the Rolling Stones tour in 1975. You know, just something totally unrelated. All right, maybe that's not all that funny. Um, but the best um, advertisements are those ones for prescription drugs. Because, you know, they'll tell you something really nice. You know, there'll be the sun will be shining. There will be birds singing. And people will be smiling and happy. And, you know, it'll say, like, uh, you should ask your doctor about substance D for your depression. And then you get the, you know, the the warning. Dun, dun, dun. It'll say, warning, substance D has been linked to serious side effects, including but not limited to memory loss, uncontrollable diarrhea, jock itch, seizures, and erections lasting 10 hours or more, projectile vomiting, and slow, agonizing death. Some patients have described seeing lights at the end of the tunnel while on substance D. You should call 911 immediately if you begin to die while on substance D. Yeah. Then you think, geez, why would anybody take this medication, you know? Um, but I think that that's like a good format for advertisements, you know? They tell you what's good about it, but then somebody tells you the truth about what could happen to you if you fall for this advertising, you know? Like, what if political ads came with the same, you know, warnings? Like, you get this ad- advertisement for candidate B. Vote for me, candidate B. I will fight for you, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then it says warning. Voting for this candidate has been linked to severe mental retardation and the inability to be an individual. This candidate may not be for everyone. You should not vote for this candidate if you value your freedom. You know, 
or uh, credit cards. What's in your wallet? Blah, blah, blah. You know, telling you about this credit card that you should get. And then they should have a warning afterward, like with the prescription drugs. Warning. Use of this credit card has been shown to lead to being a broke-ass motherfucker. You should not use this credit card if you ever want to be out of debt. Call the Consumer Protection Bureau immediately if any of the following symptoms occur. Your interest rate changes without notice. You incur fees and penalties exceeding the amount... Pre- uh. you, <laughs> you exceed... You incur fees and penalties exceeding the amount permitted by law. Yeah, I would not be a good, um, you know, person to read advertisements. I wonder what ever happened to that guy who's like, he used to do the uh, Micro Machines commercials. It's like, he, he was, I think, in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the fastest talker of all time. And he used to be on these advertisements where it's like, blah, 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 you know, anyway. Yeah, just Google Micro Machines advertisement. You know, watch the video. I'm sure it's out there somewhere on YouTube. The guy would talk like 500 words a minute. Anyway. All right. Well, it is uh, still the season of the primaries and the Democrats, uh, you know, narrowing down the field a little bit. Billionaire Tom Steyer is out of the race. So here is the sound effect of Tom Steyer's campaign going right down the fucking toilet. Yep. Tom Steyer. Good buyer and good riddance. So now there's only two billionaires left in the race. Um, yeah, I don't know what Tom Steyer was really about, but uh, I guess, you know, you can never have too many billionaires, too much money in politics, right? So um, I thought, you know, in honor of the primaries, we'd uh, see, you know, what movies, if each of these political campaigns, if each of these candidates was a movie, what movie would it be? All right, so here's what I came up with. Joe Biden would be the movie Dead Man Walking. <laughs> Starring uh, Susan Sarandon and um, I think Dennis Quaid or one of the Quaid brothers, Randy Quaid. Somebody named Quaid was in that movie. Oh, no, never mind. It wasn't one of the Quaids. It was Sean Penn. I'm sorry. All right, so Dead Man Walking starring Sean Penn and Susan Sarandon. That would be... Joe Biden, if he was a movie, or if his campaign was a movie. What about Bernie Sanders? The Hunt for Red October. (laughs) Yep, The Hunt for Red October, because he's a red commie bastard. You know, standing up for uh, the legacy of Fidel Castro in Cuba and Vladimir Lenin in the Soviet Union and Mao Zedong in China. Yep, somebody's got to keep the legacy of those dead commie bastards alive. So that would be Bernie Sanders, The Hunt for Red October. All right, Elizabeth Warren. What movie would she be? Pocahontas. You know, because, of course, she's like one of the few. uh, There is uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who we'll get to in a minute, a minority candidate. But uh, aside from Tulsi Gabbard, Elizabeth Warren is the last one of the last remaining minority uh, candidates. She is 0.0000001% Native American. She slightly has less Native American ancestry than Christopher Columbus, you know, so she's right up there with Christopher Columbus as far as, you know, Native American heritage goes. But yes, she used her Native American heritage to get a job at Harvard. And you know that if she wins the nomination, Trump has already got that as her nickname, Pocahontas. So that's what we'll be hearing, you know, um, for the rest of the election cycle. The movie Pocahontas for Elizabeth Warren. All right, Tulsi Gabbard mentioned her. Um, Her movie would be City Lights by Charlie Chaplin. Why? Because it's a silent movie. And uh, so far, Tulsi Gabbard has really been prevented from getting her word out by the mainstream media and by DNC and the debate, um, you know, platform program. They don't, her, uh, Andrew Yang, others, they didn't want them to have an opportunity to talk. But as soon as a billionaire comes in the race who's white and who's connected to the upper tenth of a percent, well, of course, they roll out the red carpet for him. How can we change the debate rules to make room for you, Mayor Bloomberg? Um, so anyway, yeah, Tulsi Gabbard, if, if her campaign was a movie, it would be City Lights or any of the other silent movies, um, you know, with no dialogue, no opportunity to speak or, uh, make their voices heard. All right. Amy Klobuchar, what movie would she be? How about Teen Wolf 2? 
Uh, why? Because it is a movie that did not need to be made. Yep. And Amy Klobuchar also is a campaign that did not need to happen. What the hell does she even stand for? I don't know. It's like she's just a carbon copy of basically every DNC, you know, talking point. It's like, all right, there's enough liberals, you know, who spout off the party line about all that. So what is she offering? What is she bringing to the table? I don't know. But she's just there. Kind of like the movie Teen Wolf 2. It was just there in the theaters uh, for you to see. Even though there was no point in seeing it, there was no point in the movie being made. All right. Mike Bloomberg. What is Mike Bloomberg's... uh, If his campaign was a movie, it would be Theodore Rex. Why? You've never heard of Theodore Rex. I hadn't heard of Theodore Rex. It's a 1995 movie starring Whoopi Goldberg. And it has a distinction of being the most expensive direct-to-video movie ever. It was before the days of DVD, so it just went straight to VHS. At 52 point, on a $52.5 million budget, it went nowhere in the theaters and went straight to DVD. Or straight to VHS, rather. Uh, so that would be... Summary of the Mike Bloomberg campaign, spending a lot of money, huge budget, and it fizzles out and goes nowhere. All right, Pete Buttigieg, or Pete Buttigieg, however you pronounce his last name, what movie would he be? Well, of course, I'm going to go stereotypical here and say Brokeback Mountain. Why? Not just because it was a gay movie, but the only reason you heard of that movie was because it was a gay movie. Had the uh, central characters in Brokeback Mountain been heterosexual? heterosexual nobody would have watched the movie nobody would have heard of the movie um it was you know the only reason you heard of it was like oh it's a gay cowboy movie had it been a a straight cowboy movie it would have gone straight to dvd straight to video nobody would have seen it it certainly would have been you know nominated for any oscars or anything like that similarly pete booty a small town mayor with no other political experience and no real you know uh, ideas that he's standing for, you know, in the way that Andrew Yang, for example, was all about, you know, the universal basic income and this kind of idea that we have to prepare for automation and AI, you know, and uh, the changes that'll wreak on the economy. No such uh, ideas from Pete Boudigay. He's just, you know, whatever he needs to say to get elected and his, you know, paper thin resume of being a small town mayor and not all that great of a mayor. But he's getting a lot of attention because he's gay. Similarly, that movie broke back mountain. All right. Last but not least, Donald Trump. What movie would Donald Trump be? If the Trump campaign was a movie, it would be the movie Idiocracy. Yes, Idiocracy. Um, It was... Well, it didn't, it kind of got buried by the, by the studio that produced it. You know, it was Mike Judge, who uh, also did Office Space, another uh, cult classic, great movie. Um, But Idiocracy kind of didn't get a lot of push from the studios. Why? Because they were worried about lawsuits. They had, um, it's kind of a funny thing, actually. They had uh, product placement, you know, advertising or whatnot or deals with like Starbucks and, and uh, other companies, but they didn't ask, you know, when they, when the, the studio worked that out, they didn't talk to Mike judge to make sure he was going to present these companies in a positive light. So in the movie, it's set in the year 2,500, uh, AD and, or 2,500 CE for you, uh, non-Christian people. Um, it's set in the year 2,500, basically all, the, the the human race has devolved to the point where everybody's a retard and like uh, you know these people who had been part of this military experience experiment there was a one average soldier and then this prostitute they picked up off the street who like had thoroughly average IQs they're frozen in this time capsule and then uh, you know the year twenty five hundred somehow their um, cryogenic frozen chamber is opened up and they emerge to find that they are the smartest people in the entire world um anyway it's like uh and the the president of course is like it was a reality tv star oh my goodness a 2005 movie that predicted donald trump bs mike judge's movie uh idiocracy anyway the reason why i got buried 
they had these product placement deals from like Starbucks, but then they show in the movie like Starbucks doesn't sell coffee. They give hand jobs or they give hand jobs with your coffee, stuff like that. That just gives you an idea of like all the companies that, you know, paid the studio to get their products in the film. Well, Mike Judge kind of had fun with that. And so a lot of these companies probably didn't care for the way their products were featured in that movie. So it's actually a funny movie if you if you get the chance to watch Idiocracy by Mike Judge. Anyway, that would be if Donald Trump was or his campaign was a movie, it would be the movie Idiocracy. All right, well, that brings me to the end of this crazy comedy humor and satire podcast, episode number 37 for Sunday, March 1st, 2020. Thank you so much for listening. And just a reminder to check out the sponsor of this program, which is... A shameless plug for my own book, Super Hashtag SJW Man, A Call Out Culture, Superhero Satire, available on Amazon, paperback, ebook, and audiobook is coming soon. But if you hate the super woke, if you enjoy satire, if you like, uh, you know, funny kind of books, uh, check it out. The uh, link will be in the show notes underneath. Anyway, thank you so much. You guys have a great weekend. Hasta luego. Piaches.